It is, of course, impossible to open up these issues without some brief reference to issues of very immediate interest in the lives of the Anglican and Roman Catholic communions. The image in the English language of mentioning the elephant in the room, which is otherwise implicit, comes to mind here. The current proposals for a covenant between Anglican provinces represent an effort to create not a centralized decision-making executive, but a community of communities that can manage to sustain a mutual, mutually nourishing and mutually critical life, with all of them consenting to certain protocols of decision-making together. As the harvesting book notes, Anglicans have been challenged to flesh out their rhetoric about communion through the crises and controversies of recent years. And this is simply part of a very big response that will no doubt continue for a good while yet to be refined and formulated. The recent announcement of an apostolic constitution making provision for former Anglicans shows some marks of the recognition that diversity of ethos does not in itself compromise the unity of the Roman Catholic Church, even within the bounds of the historic Western Patriarchate. But it should be obvious that it does not seek to do what we have been sketching. It does not build in any formal recognition of existing ministries or units of oversight or methods of independent decision making, but remains at the level of spiritual and liturgical culture, so to speak. As such, it is an imaginative, pastoral response to the needs of some, but it does not break any fresh ecclesiological ground. It remains to be seen whether the flexibility suggested in the Constitution might ever lead to something less like a chaplaincy and more like a church gathered by a bishop. Then as to the broad issue of local and universal Christian identity, much that has emerged from discussion involving Roman Catholics, Anglicans, and Orthodox has had the effect of challenging a simplistic opposition between the two poles, as if the choice were between a conglomerate of local and almost randomly diverse communities, vaguely federated together, and a monolithic global corporation. The re theologizing of ecclesiology, as I describe it, especially in dialogue with the Christian has meant that we are now better able to see the local community gathered around the bishop or his representative for Eucharistic worship, not as a portion of some greater whole, but as itself the whole, the qualitative presence, as we might put it, of the Catholic reality of filial holiness and Trinitarian mutuality here and now. In one sense, it needs no supplement or validation from a wider institution reality. In another sense, of course, it is itself only as relating with other communities, doing the same thing in all times and places. To quote here from the Roman Catholic Reform Dialogue, it is only by participating in the local community that we share in the life of the universal church. But the local community without universality runs the risk of becoming a ghetto or being arbitrarily dominated by individuals. Or again, in the words of the archaic statement on the gift of authority, no local church that participates in the living tradition can regard itself as self-sufficient. So the question here becomes one about what criteria help us to establish that the same Catholic life 